Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Kristen Moroz. I'm one of the co-directors of the Minnesota Green Step Cities uh, and Tribal Nations programs. And we're excited today to have our uh, monthly workshop topic about the new approaches to parking management um, and all of the fun and interesting um, details that, that go in and behind the scenes with that. So um, we have a couple of really great speakers with us this morning. And we'll have an opportunity to kind of share what's going on in your own community is uh, and what you want to, you know, maybe work on in this area in the future as well. And so, um, Barb, I think I'm going to hand it over to you to kind of introduce yourself, kick things off, set our agenda, um, and just let Emily know when you're ready to switch slides. Hey, thanks, Kristen. Uh, let's switch slides now so we can show the agenda. Great. So good morning, everyone. Um, this is our agenda for today. Thanks so much for having an interest in parking and joining with us to to learn and then also um, to discuss uh, among our among small groups um, ways to move things forward in the area of parking. So we'll I'll kick it off. I'll move then to uh, Tony Johnson, who's going to tell us all about the innovations um, in the city of St. Paul. Then we'll have a good hour of small group discussions because we want to hear from you about what you're doing in your city um, to uh, modernize the way that you approach parking. And then we're going to come back together and talk about this and, and also talk about whether there are ways in which um, we can keep working on this collectively, either um, on the topic of, of off street parking or moving into better management of curb parking or design of parking, or are there legislative changes we need um, in the area of parking? So there'll be time for us to really hear from all of you about what you're doing, what the barriers are, what you need help with, um, and that will help to move uh, this area of parking reform forward. So again, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, next slide, uh, please, Kristen. So um, my name is Barb Thoman, and I am uh, what they call a Green Step Cities advisor. Um, and my degree um, was in finance, but I worked for about 10 years in solid waste management. And then after that, about 20 years focusing on public transit bike ped access, traffic safety, um, and transportation funding. And, and I've had an interest in parking for a really long time. Um, back in 2003, I wrote the report that you see here on the screen, the myth of free parking, when I was working at um, transit for livable communities. Um, and parking reform really didn't take off after that report, like we hoped that it would, but we're hoping that it's really taking off now. Um, I also spoke at this uh, meeting uh, that you see uh, in the photograph at the bottom of the screen. That was not a happy public meeting. Um, and uh, as uh, you may know, if you shop on Grand Avenue in St. Paul, there still are not parking meters on Grand, but I'm, I'm hoping that um, they'll be coming someday. So um, parking is really a big topic and it's it's complex, and so we thought that for this workshop, it really made sense um, to focus on one aspect of parking, and that's off-street parking, because that in and of itself um, is big enough. So my presentation is going to be about um, kind of a high level about off-street parking. Oh, wow. I want um, everyone to mute if they can. Um, and then Tony Johnson from the city of St. Paul is going to really dig into what's happening um, or what has occurred in St. Paul at the local level. And, and even if you're um, from a suburban city uh, or from a greater Minnesota uh, smaller city, I think there's still a lot you can learn from what Tony, the information Tony gathered from around the country to um, make the changes that they've made um, in St. Paul. So in the future, maybe we can talk about um, some of these other uh, parking topics that maybe we're also thinking about. So I think this topic, um, you know, really is timely. And it's timely uh, for the reasons of climate change and the need to address um, emissions from the transportation sector. Um, and it's also timely because of the pandemic and how the pandemic may have permanently changed the way that people get around, the way they shop and where they work. So next slide, please. 
So um, if you are a Green Step City, and I think many of you um, that are participating today are members of the Green Step City program, um, you'll find that parking reform actions are located under in two sections um, of Green Step City's best practices, both um, in transportation and then also in land use. And when I look back at that report from 2003, there was um, a quote in the inside cover um, from Kurt Johnson, who at the time the report um, was written was the chair of um, the Metropolitan Council. And the quote is this, he says, parking is the epitome of the land use transportation interface, yet it has been the most ignored element in the transportation system to date. Um, and he said that 20 years ago, but I think that that is still true today, that parking is a, is a pretty underappreciated element of the transportation system and one in which change can make a tremendous um, difference. So next slide, please. So my presentation is going to hit um, the high points from this parking management guidebook that the Green Step Cities program um, has recently um, published. And I hope that all of you have um, had a chance to download the report. And if you haven't, then um, certainly we can put a link in the chat and you can um, print yourselves a copy or get a copy online. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about the history of parking requirements, um, the impacts and benefits of right sizing, steps to evaluate and update your city code, um, and some resources. So next slide, please. So um, we can't really talk about parking without just acknowledging why we need parking. Um, and certainly we need parking for long term and short term storage of vehicles. And in Minnesota, we have about 7 million registered vehicles in Minnesota. So that's that's a lot of vehicles that need to be that need to be parked. Um, we also need parking for access to jobs, health care, destinations in general. Um, and we need parking because we've designed our cities to prioritize um, access by vehicle. So we also need to acknowledge that there are big subsidies for driving and parking. And so the demand for parking is higher than it would be if there were price signals and more options, more ways um, for people to get around. Next slide. Um, so um, I read a book um, by Richard Wilson that was called Parking Reform Made Easy. And he talks a little bit about the history of parking requirements. So the first parking requirements came, were uh, instituted in Columbus, Ohio in 1923. And by 1972, parking requirements had swept the country and nearly all cities had parking requirements. And most cities followed guidance that was in a document, the Institute for Transportation Engineers uh, Parking Generation Manual or they copied, cities copied their requirements from other cities. And both of these methods um, for establishing parking requirements um, have been highly criticized. Um, in, uh, in 2005, um, Donald Shoup uh, first published his uh, lengthy and influential book called The High Cost of Free Parking. And Dr. Shoup was merciless in his uh, critique of the methods that were used by the ITE to establish these parking ratios. And he noted in the book that there were very few data points. There was extreme variation in the numbers. The locations that were surveyed were all suburban locations with no bike, ped, or transit access. And nevertheless, these, these ratios were, were said to be very precise um, and really relevant to all communities, which was absolutely um, not the case. So next slide, please. So we can't uh, talk about parking without talking about its um, substantial costs. And um, I just put this little table together um, just to give you an idea of how much a, a parking stall actually costs. And when we say a stall, a stall means the parking space and the access lanes that, that lead to it. So in a surface lot, the capital cost of parking ranges 
from $3,500 in a surface lot to $50,000 in an underground parking ramp. And a, an above ground ramp would be kind of in the middle, about $25,000 in capital costs. And then the annual operating and maintenance costs are also substantial, $540 a year um, for maintaining a surface lot and $5,400 a year maintaining, maintaining an underground space. And I just did a quick look last night um, to try to get numbers for um, a ramp here in the metro, a, a, a recent project. And I noted that the new um, parking ramp at the airport, um, the cost per stall in that ramp is about $58,000 um, per parking space. And you know these costs absolutely will vary based on um, the community, the land price, um, where the parking is being built, but these are substantial costs that we need to be cognizant of and thinking about. So next slide, please. So now I'm going to go through a few slides um, about the benefits of right sizing and right pricing um, parking uh, and focusing mostly on the right sizing um, piece of this. And um, these topics are all covered in greater depth within the um, guidebook. But, you know, it's going to be really important, you know, as you think about or maybe make a proposal for some kind of changes to your parking requirements, that you're able to talk with stakeholders, with your planning commissioners, with elected officials um, about the rationale, the reasons why right sizing is a good idea and the many caught problems that are caused um, by an oversupply of parking. So, you know, parking has um, an opportunity cost and cities forego property tax revenue from higher value uses when they supply parking and especially when it's oversupplied. And I'll give you an example from um, that's sort of near and dear to me. And this is from my church. So I attend a church in St. Paul and it has two parking lots, a small one adjacent to the church that's used very often. Um, and then another lot that the church was required to build because the city used to require that um, uh, a church had uh, one parking space for every three feet um, in the, of, of pew space. And so we have a lot that's got about 50 spaces and it is very minimally used. And it is a hole in the middle of a beautiful residential neighborhood and across the street um, from this parking lot there are three majestic older homes and those homes um, pay property taxes annually that are collectively about thirty thousand dollars so every year um, this the city is and and the church of course doesn't isn't paying property taxes um, on that land and so um, $30,000 might not seem like a lot of money, but when you think about St. Paul having um, 100 to 150 churches, now we're talking real money. We're talking over a million dollars in foregone revenue. Um, and, uh, and if you multiply that by um, excess parking across the city, that's really a tremendous amount of revenue and a tremendous amount of land. And I'm certainly not suggesting that we shouldn't have any parking at churches, just that the parking that we have and that we're requiring needs to really make sense. Um, and another opportunity cost or cost is really the loss of historic structures. And, and I think we can all think of um, both, both um, historic and just your average buildings that were still usable that have been torn down to provide parking for the building um, next door. And then finally, on the cost side, um, many cities have direct costs for operating municipal lots and ramps where fees are not charged. And, and that affects a city's bottom line. Next slide, please. So um, parking also has a big uh, impact on the cost of housing. And I think Tony will talk a little bit more about this, but you know, the more parking that's required, the higher is going to be the cost of a home, a condominium or an apartment. Um, and studies have shown that structured parking can add about $140 per month or $1,700 a year to the cost of rent 
And this is about 17% of rental cost. And we've also heard from housing developers that high parking costs can even prevent the construction of affordable housing. So there are ways in which the parking code can be structured such that um, you allow uh, affordable, park, affordable housing to have no parking or less parking, or you don't require that all of the parking be enclosed because that erases the cost um, of parking. So another thing to be thinking about in terms of the cost of requiring um, substantial parking with housing. Next slide, please. And parking has um, some really significant environmental benefits or environmental impacts that we don't um, often think about. So uh, I went to the staff in the stormwater department at um, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and got some estimates for how much water runs off a parking space. And again, it's a parking space is a parking space and the access lane that that gets you to it. So the precipitation on one surface parking stall in Minnesota can generate 5,600 gallons of runoff annually. And in uh, southeastern Minnesota, say in uh, uh, you know Houston County, it'll be more. Up in Kitson County in the far northwest, it would be somewhat less. But that's the average number. And all of those gallons of water contribute to flood risk and to damage to streams in the summer when the water coming off parking lots is superheated, and in the winter when the water coming off of parking lots is laden with chloride for winter de-icing. And I think here in Minnesota, we are just beginning to understand the permanent damage that's being done to our water bodies and our groundwater from this de-icing salt that's washing off of surface parking. Um, and then the other the other environmental impact is urban heat. Um, and, and this is a, because we're we're having warmer summers. We're hearing more about the urban heat island effect. So the surface temperature of parking lots can be 50 to 90 degrees warmer than the air. And the University of Minnesota did a really interesting study looking at um, temperature differentiation differentials around um, the metropolitan area based on um, impervious surface. And they found that um, areas that are have a high degree of impervious surface can be nine degrees warmer than surrounding areas, which adds significantly. I think they said five to 10% of summer cooling costs are related to this urban heat island effect. Um, so next slide, please. And then finally, um, in you know, level, oops, my slides went away. <laughs> um, level the playing field um, for transportation modes. And subsidizing only parking provides an incentive for people to drive or to drive more often. Um, and it also subsidized parking is really not fair to those people who cannot, um, because of a disability or low income or choices they're making, um, it, it unfairly, um, parking unfairly subsidizes um, drivers over the people that are not using the parking. And that can be, it could, parking raises the cost of, of nearly everything, services, uh, groceries, um, all sorts of things that we, we buy, use, and services we need. Um, so really our zoning code and our city policy should encourage those actions that help achieve city goals. And I think most cities have goals to increase mode share by transit, biking and walking um, and to reduce um, climate impacts. So parking can have an impact on all of, of these things. So um, next slide, please. So um, now we're gonna talk, now we have, uh, you know, the, we talked about the cost, we've talked about um, the benefits of right sizing, but um, I think now let's, let's move into how is it that we are, um, are gonna try to make change in, in the area of parking. So next slide, please. 
Um, and I, I just want to acknowledge as I start these few slides that um, there are there is innovation going on all around Minnesota and um, I'm going to touch on a few things, but um, we are also working on what we're calling a case study document that that will list um, cities across the state and the innovations that they're making um, in the area of parking reform. And so your city, if you have an innovation, we certainly want to hear from you because we will include that in this um, document. So some of this may resonate um, with you. Hopefully most of it does. Um, so um, if you're going to try to convince, you know, your planning commission that the city should reduce minimums or reduce maximums or make some major changes in parking, it's going to be essential that you have data um because everyone has an anecdote about parking um about the time that they went somewhere and they had to cruise for a little while or they couldn't find a parking space and those stories without good data are going to torpedo any efforts that you make to try to change your parking requirements so here's some steps when you think about um uh getting this data that we're going to need to make the case one, and Tony, I think we'll talk about this, is evaluate your variance requests over the past few years. So what have you, where, how many times have you had to make variances for off-street parking requirements? And, you know, and what have you been hearing from um, developers or the hardware store that wanted to expand or the restaurant that wanted to expand? What, is, what kind of comments are you getting um, from, from businesses in your community about your parking requirements? And then um, another step would be to what we call take a, a windshield survey. And that it sounds sort of simple, but it, it's, a, it's, it's a, an easy way to kind of go around town or go in a particular area of the city or corridor and just start taking a look at how much parking, off street parking is being used at what times of the day, how much oversupply, if there is some, are you seeing? And then you can get down kind of to the nitty gritty where you actually identify an area of the city um, or areas of the city. And maybe it's um, maybe it's the downtown, maybe it's um, a commercial corridor, maybe it's just a certain kind of land use, uh, a restaurant or commercial um, designation and actually do um, a survey. And surveys can be done in sort of high tech ways or low tech ways that can be done in-house with staff in-house um, with interns there certainly are consultants um, both minnesota and nationally that do um, parking surveys but you know you'll need to identify days of the week time of the day number of days um, per week or month so that you can get some real data to help you um, make some changes or propose some changes. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the guidebook has, um, the parking guidebook that we put together has sort of 14 steps for um, evaluating or kind of a checklist and evaluating your parking requirements. And there's a lot more detail in the, in the book than I'm just gonna have on these two slides. But you just wanna ask yourself, um, some of these questions you know when was the last time that your code um, was updated and um, it really should be you know every at least every five years that you look at the code take a hard look at it um, and decide uh, you know are, is it time to make another round of changes to the code and then how many categories um, of land uses do you have do you regulate and i've looked at codes from a number of cities around Minnesota, and the range seems to be pretty wide from uh, a low of seven in a small greater Minnesota city to a high of 150 um, at the city of Minneapolis. So, you know, you certainly want differentiation, um, but you have to have uh, a number that is really manageable and understandable. And whether you have eliminated your minimums or not, you're still going to want this differentiation because you're going to want to have parking maximums. And then a question for, for you, and, and I know most cities have areas of the city that either don't have minimums at all, 
um, or they have um, reduced minimums in particular parts of the city. So um, this might be a downtown. A lot of cities don't have parking requirements, minimum requirements in the downtown, um, but they um, you know, still have them in the rest of the city, or they might not have minimums in a mixed use district, or they have lower minimums in a mixed use district. And that doesn't mean that they're not allowing parking in those districts. It just means that they're um, either negotiating, um, they're, they're doing parking on a district wide basis, um, and they're letting the developers decide how much to build, or they're managing parking such that um, the off street um, ramps and lots are collectively managed and maybe collectively paid for um, so such that you don't have to remove buildings and provide all this parking you know at each individual um, use and um, number four um, the availability of on-street parking that really must be considered when you are looking at parking requirements because often on street parking can provide enough parking for a lot of your small commercial uses. So many cities are starting to exempt, say, the first thousand square feet uh, gross floor area of um, commercial buildings because the on street parking, especially if it's managed well, um, can compensate for the off street parking that would be needed. Um, for people to access um, the uses along that particular corridor. And then um, maximums, and I mentioned this already, but um, every city should have maximum parking requirements, um, or and some cities even have caps, such that so that you don't have a few developers that are going to want to overbuild parking, build parking for the future that then they may never need and then have all the impacts that we talked about previously. So, um, you know, and the maximum should be a low enough number that it actually makes a difference. Um, and you can, some cities require um, that if you want to build up to the maximum, you have to have a travel demand management plan um, or you have to have proof of parking. So you have to show that you're doing everything you can to minimize the need for this extra parking before you're allowed to add extra um, spaces above the minimum. Um, so next slide, please. Um, and so uh, the um, other ways in which the code, it'd be, it's good to review the code is thinking about are there ways in which you can modify your code to incentivize the things that you want to have happen, like the construction of affordable housing. And I mentioned that under the benefits section, but you know, you can, it's like I've noticed some cities require that, you know, multifamily housing have every unit um, of housing has to have two parking spaces and one of them has to be enclosed. Well, that's really going to raise the cost of affordable housing. So maybe you, the, the requirement is less than that. It's one space. It doesn't have to be enclosed or you negotiate with the developer and you let the developer decide what makes sense in this particular um, use, housing use. And um, we have seen uh, the city of Minneapolis has really seen that the amount of housing or the amount of parking that's being provided um, for affordable housing has really gone down now that they are given developers more flexibility. Um, and and St. Paul will talk about how um, they are beginning to require unbundling of parking so that the parking space has to be rented separately from the unit itself so that the people who need it pay for it, the people who don't need it, and often people with lower incomes are not paying for um, something they don't need. Um, so uh, I guess I must, I need to move a little bit quicker here, but um, other things to look for in the code, are you requiring um, bicycle parking? Mo the code should require bicycle parking. They are, it should require long-term and short-term parking. It should say things about the type of bicycle parking and where it should be located. Um, and then shared parking. Does the, does the code allow for shared parking? And uh, there are 
some great um, examples that you can find for shared parking agreements. Um, you can, uh, uh, there are both, there's good language for code and there's also good language for shared parking agreements that you'll be able to find and consultants are also happy to help you um, with this. And then uh, looking through the code, is there, or you're just thinking about parking management in your city, are there, are there locations in the city where you have a tremendous amount of activity on a very few weekends or days of the year? So are there ways in which you can um, use some kind of shuttle service so that you're not having to require parking that is then very minimally used for most of the year? And many of you may remember that at one time, um, Como Park in St. Paul wanted to build a parking ramp, and there was a tremendous amount of, of uh, controversy um, about that. And ultimately, they came to the conclusion that there weren't that many weekends um, or weekdays where they needed um, all this parking, and that most of the year it would sit empty. So instead, they have contracted with a private firm to run the Como Park shuttle. So is that something that would make sense in the city um, where you live and work? And finally, does the code have provision um, for electric vehicle charging? That will be in your in your off street parking requirements. That is going to be important um, as more of the mix of vehicles switches over to electric vehicles. So next slide, please. So um, implementation. Uh, once you know you've reviewed the code you've gotten some real data um then it's time to um you know really propose a round of changes to the parking requirements and you would approach this as any just like any other controversial planning topic um that you're addressing and i think i guess nearly any any topic these days in planning it seems to be controversial but you know, you need a plan with goals and action steps. You need a budget, you need a timeline. And parking is, I would say, parking is almost always controversial. So, you know, getting buy-in from your planning commission, from elected officials and the business community early and talking with them often um, is gonna be really key to making change in this area because nearly everybody drives and parks and everyone has an idea of what the right answer is and, and what should and, and, and people love to park free. So um, it's going to take, um, you know, a really concerted and uh, an organized effort to communicate um, why these changes are important. And and so this a plan for education and engagement is going to be essential. And I think Tony will have some terrific ideas about this. And then um, because parking touches on so many other transportation topics, um, getting help from other city departments, whether it's the health department and, and the issues of um, talking about urban heat and public health, stormwater, talking about reducing your stormwater folks and talking about reducing runoff, and public works and talking about you know, access and traffic and congestion as it relates to parking will also help you um, make your case. So next slide, and I think it's my last slide. Um, there are a tremendous amount of resources to help you think about um, making change in the area of parking. Um, I talked about the two, the Donald Shoup, Dr. Donald Shoup, and he has two books um, that are, um, have great information in them, and he's a wonderful writer, so they're hilarious. So they're also uh, fun reading. Um, American Planning Association, almost always in their magazine, have articles about um, parking, and they also have a really great um, website with lots of information um, for people who are members of the American Planning Association. Um, the Parking Reform Network is a new national organization, and I think that Tony um, Jordan from the network is on our, our webinar today, and he may say some things um, or just introduce himself um, after we both speak, Tony and I, but um, they have some great resources and, and what, are soon going to have a wonderful database of cities um, and the innovations that are being made in cities around the country uh, related to parking. And then Streets Blog, um, their website, um, their blog, they also have just a great um, 
uh, podcast called Talking Headways, and I've listened to several of the podcasts they have about parking, and they've been very good. Um, our own Streets MN has information on parking, and then of course the consulting community, uh, in both Minnesota and nationally, have some um, um, people who are very talented and, and know a lot about parking. Um, and I just want to shout out to um, Lance uh, Bernard, who um, helped very much um, with the parking guidebook and he's a consultant with HKGI here in the Twin Cities. So that's all for my slides. I hope that just gives you a taste of uh, a little bit about cost, about benefits, and about um, some ways in which we can think about the code and start to make, uh, start to modernize the way that we approach um, parking both um, in the Twin Cities region and across the state. So thanks very much. Thank you, Barb, for going through that. I hope you all um, found the link in the chat to the guidebook that Barb was referencing um, those pages from. And we will be sure to send that out um, afterwards as well, along with all the slides in the video recording with you. Um, Jake, I see your comment in here, but I wonder if we'll, we hold, hold off on that question um, until after Tony goes through his slides um, to see what we hear. And then if there are any other questions, um, for Barb or Tony, as we continue here, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand. I am not seeing any right now other than Jake's. Um, so maybe we'll just switch over to Tony. Emily, do you want to stop sharing the screen? And we'll let Tony share. Perfect, you are all set up. So welcome, Tony. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Tony Johnson, and I'm a senior planner um, for the city of St. Paul, um, and I led our study to eliminate minimum parking requirements. Um, so in St. Paul, uh, minimum parking requirements were first introduced to the zoning code in 1954. Um, and that requirement was just a one per space uh, or one uh, space per residential unit. Um, in 1975, uh, when we adopted our modern zoning code, uh, we then applied parking minimums to nearly every use in the zoning code um, and kind of continued that way um, until um, 2009, uh, which was our last kind of major uh, parking reform. Um, and so with that study, uh, what we did is we reduced uh, minimum parking requirements generally across the board. Uh, we introduced um, parking maximums to the code for the first time, um, and that study also introduced additional design requirements for parking facilities. Um, in 2011, uh, as a part of our central corridor zoning study, uh, parking, and so the central corridor is a light rail line which connects um, downtown Minneapolis to downtown St. Paul for context. Uh, we eliminated parking minimums uh, within a quarter mile of university for parcels that were zoned traditional neighborhood. Um, and this was a really kind of important step in the history of kind of St. Paul's parking policies uh, because this was the first time that we eliminated parking minimums outside of downtown. Um, so then in 2018, um, this study was initiated in order to update um, provisions in our zoning code related to parking. Um, and one of the reasons why uh, we wanted to um, update our zoning code is because of the amount of space that we dedicate um, to parking. Um, so in St. Paul, about 35.6% of St. Paul's land area, area is dedicated primarily to the purpose of moving and storing automobiles. Of that, we have roughly uh, 631 acres of garage space, uh, roughly 8,560 acres of right away, uh, and we have about 2,650 acres of surface parking, uh, which is roughly four times the size of downtown St. Paul. Um, and although uh, a lot of this parking was built at the discretion of property owners over time, uh, one of the implications of having minimum parking requirements is that uh, this parking is maintained um, and that we will also um, add, to add to our supply of parking over time. Um, and take up more space for parking. Um, and so on this side, um, I illustrated uh, some of our old parking requirements uh, to show how much space you would need to 
to dedicate to parking um, in order to meet our minimum parking, our old minimum parking requirements. Um, so for a bar, for example, um, if you were to build a new bar under our old uh, parking code, 63% uh, of the development's area would have to be used for parking and uh, without factoring in um, setbacks or landscaping requirements. Um, and 37% would be used for the building that it serves. Um, for the majority of commercial uses, we had a, a requirement of one space per 400 square feet, um, which is much better than a bar, but that would also result in a, in a kind of development uh, form where 39% of the area would be used for parking and 61% of the development's area would be used for the building. Um, and, and one of the things that uh, we have to realize with parking requirements um, is that they often uh, lead to an oversupply of parking uh, because when parking minimums were originally developed, uh, the kind of prevailing um, planning par paradigm was that an oversupply of parking was preferable to a undersupply of parking. Um, so parking requirements were designed to be inherently conservative in order to accommodate potentially infrequent peak, peak demands of free off-street parking. Um, the other reason why parking requirements uh, may lead to an oversupply is that parking requirements are blunt instruments uh, which are often uh, determined by one factor that may influence off-street parking demand, such as the square footage of a commercial use or the number of residential units in the, in the development. However, in actuality, uh, there's numerous uh, factors that actually, you, you know, that affect actual parking demand, right? Such as surrounding density and the mix of land uses, uh, the price of parking, access to public transportation, et cetera. Um, and in these pictures, I'm kind of showing um, an example of how um, density in the mix of land uses can influence actual parking demand. So here we have two targets. Uh, one is in um, Minneapolis and Dinkytown, um, and one is in St. Paul and Midway. Um, and as you can see, uh, the uh, one in Minneapolis uh, has very little parking, um, whereas the one in St. Paul has a lot of parking. And the reason why um, the one in Minneapolis is, is a viable business and can operate without uh, much off-street parking is because it's in a dense uh, urban environment uh, with um, uh, a good mix of nearby land uses. Um, and so um, maintaining um, this amount of parking and kind of this uh, inflexible uh, minimum parking uh, was really antithetical to policies and two documents which uh, kind of form the policy foundation for this study. Um, so the first document is the Climate Action and Resiliency Plan, um, the other being the 2040 comp Comprehensive Plan. Um, so in our uh, Climate Action and Resili Resiliency Plan, um, we are calling for St. Paul to be carbon neutral by 2050. And today, nearly one third of St. Paul's carbon emissions come from vehicle travel, which is primarily from single occupancy vehicle trips. Um, so in order for us to uh, meet our goal, uh, we are going to need to change travel behavior over time. Um, the, uh, our, our current parking policy is also antithetical to comprehensive plan policies, uh, such as policy LU14, which calls for reducing the amount of land devoted to off-street parking, um, and policy T21, which calls for reducing vehicle miles traveled by 40% by 2040. Um, it's also our current, our, our old parking policy was uh, impeding our um, housing goals as well, such as policy H18, which calls for fostering the preservation and production of deeply affordable rental housing, um, et cetera. Um, so there's a number of kind of main um, uh, uh, areas, topic areas uh, that you should consider uh, when considering um, changes to your parking code. Um, the first one that I want to talk about today is climate change and carbon emissions. So how does minimum parking requirements increase carbon emissions? Um, first, uh, when minimum parking requirements create an ample supply of free parking, it incentivizes people to drive and disincentivizes lower emissions options like walking, biking, and transit. Secondly, minimum parking requirements reduce density and push destinations further apart. Uh, which makes alternatives to driving, like walking and transit, less effective and less appealing. <clears throat> um, there's also um, policy implications uh, for housing. Um, so your parking policies uh, can increase housing costs uh, primarily in two ways. 
Um, so the first way that uh, minimum parking requirements increase housing costs is by limiting density and the production of new units. Um, so in St. Paul, um, well, one of the issues that, that we've been grappling with for years is our low vacancy rate. Uh, so we have our vacancy rate for the last couple of years has been around 3.5 uh, to 4.5%. Um, and so for us to lower housing costs over time, um, one of the things that we need to do is produce more housing and create more choice in St. Paul's housing market. Uh, the other way that uh, a minimum parking requirement um, can increase the cost of housing is if it's bundled, if the, the cost of parking is bundled with the cost of housing. Um, so when you bundle uh, parking, what you're doing is you're hiding that cost of parking um, in the cost of other goods and services. Um, and when you unbundle parking, what you're doing is you're separating that cost from that good or service and making or good or service and making it so that the user has to pay for the parking um, outside of housing or outside of, um, you know, a lease for a, a commercial space. Um, right, and parking is expensive to build. Um, so as Barb uh, kind of talked about in her slides, um, a surface parking rate parking space can range uh, from anywhere from $3,500 to $5,000 per space. Um, and a structured parking space can range uh, from anywhere from $25,000 to $50,000 per space. Um, this parking then becomes an added cost for the property um, in the form of uh, monthly operations, maintenance, and debt service, which is then passed on to residents and tenants. Um, and one study found that on average, uh, this can add about $142 uh, per month to rent. Um, and one of the, the um, kind of issues with minimum parking requirements that we often don't take into account is the income level of uh, residents. Um, so typically, uh, you know, we have a parking requirement that's just based off the number of units. Um, and we're not thinking about, you know, what the income level of those of the residents will be that are going to use those units. Um, and in St. Paul, 34.3% um, of families that need or would qualify for units of affordable at 30% of area median income do not own a car. Um, yet we don't account for that, or yet we didn't account for that um, in our old parking standards. And so for lower income, income residents, um, if the cost of parking is bundled uh, you know, with the cost of housing, a minimum parking requirement is akin to a regressive tax because we're essentially requiring people to pay for parking that they don't need or use as a part of their housing costs. Um, and subsidized developments, uh, oversupplying parking is also an issue. Um, so when we, when we don't think about income levels uh, when um, you know, prescribing parking to affordable housing, um, oftentimes we are going to oversupply uh, parking, uh, which then means that a significant portion of St. Paul's limited housing resources are going to be used to construct unused parking instead of uh, instead of housing. Um, so another um, kind of issue of uh, minimum parking requirement for our, our uh, comprehensive plan goals is our is for economic development. Um, so in St. Paul, um, our economic development and kind of growth strategy is um, kind of centered around this concept of neighborhood nodes. Um, and so what we're trying to do with our 2040 comp plan um, is ensure that uh, people can meet um, their daily needs within walking distance of their house. Um, but uh, by requiring a significant portion of a development site to be used for parking and not active uses, uh, minimum parking requirements uh, detract from the walkability of commercial nodes and corridors, um, which then would make it harder for us to achieve this policy. Um, this policy for us to be successfully implemented will also require additional commercial density and a greater uh, mix of commercial uses to be developed at these neighborhood nodes. Um, and so if we left our parking requirements in place, um, it would be an impediment to achieving this goal. Um, another uh, kind of thing to consider uh, with this kind of growth strategy of uh, trying to create this land use mix where you can meet your, your um, daily needs within walking distance is that if we successfully implement this policy, um, it'll enable more short term discretionary trips to be conducted without a car. So those are the types of trips like if you're going to the grocery store or, um, you know, if you're going for, out for entertainment, um, et cetera.
Um, so the last thing I want to touch on, and just in terms of policy, is just the market value and tax revenue implications um, of uh, minimum parking requirements. Um, so in our comp plan, um, uh, policy LU63, uh, we're calling for fostering equitable and sustainable uh, growth by growing St. Paul's tax base in order to maintain and expand city services, amenities, and infrastructure. Um, and on the right, we have kind of two examples of different styles of development. Um, so on the top, uh, we have an example of uh, transit-oriented development, uh, which is yielding us a tax revenue of $12.72 um, uh, $12 per square foot. Um, and about a block away from this development, uh, we have an example of auto-oriented uh, development uh, which is yielding us a tax revenue of $1.81 per square foot. Um, so in order for us to successfully implement this policy, uh, we need to change how we're building our city um, and build more densely um, so that we can um, uh, get more tax revenue per square foot. Um, so with those um, kind of policy uh, considerations in mind, um, I developed two packages of amendments for uh, the Planning Commission and our City Council to consider. Uh, one package of amendments would have reduced minimum parking requirements. Uh, the other package of amendments eliminated minimum parking requirements. Um, with both options, uh, we also um, decoupled our bike parking requirements from our vehicular parking requirements um, and created bike parking requirements that are specific to land uses. Uh, both options require parking to be unbundled. So uh, again, just as a reminder, selling the parking separate from the cost of housing. Um, both options propose to uh, streamline processes and standards for parking. Um, and a really important piece of both options um, was amendments to our travel demand management ordinance um, and, and the creation of a supplemental uh, TDM guide. Um, so the, the term um, travel demand management um, uh, it, uh, can be broad and applied differently depending on the audience. Um, and so it's not universally defined. Um, so for example, uh, uh, you know, a business might refer to their TDM program as their commuter benefits program, um, whereas a developer may refer to it as the infrastructural elements of their site de design. However, at its core, um, TDM is focused on moving people and includes policies and programs that facilitate the reduction and redistribution of travel demand and increase efficiencies in the transportation network, ultimately fac facilitating a mode shift and reducing the number of drive alone trips. Um, and so under either option, this was really um, important because our TDM strategies support our parking strategies and vice versa. So our parking strategy to right size our parking supply um, is supported by our travel demand management strategies because travel demand management um, helps manage the demand of parking by promoting high quality alternatives to driving, such as walking, biking, and taking transit. Um, and our TDM strategy to manage the demand for parking is supported by our parking strategy to right size uh, our parking supply in order to avoid building um, excess parking um, spaces and identifying driving over other alternatives. Um, so, like uh, a lot of cities, um, the way our old um, TDM program worked uh, was was very complicated um, and super um, kind of onerous. So, um, in order to create a TDM plan in St. Paul um, under the old system, um, you needed to do uh, kind of traffic modeling and parking modeling, um, and then you know, one of the issues is that we didn't have very clear goals of kind of what was an acceptable TDM plan and what wasn't, um, and we didn't have clear trip reduction goals. Um, so one of the issues with our old system is that we were getting kind of TDM plans um, all over the place. Um, and, and because of the, the traffic modeling and parking modeling uh, requirements in particular, um, it wasn't possible for um, just a developer to do a TDM plan without having to hire um, kind of professional assistance to help them with that. Um, so our solution was to create a standardized approach to TDMs, uh, which is modeled after um, San Francisco's um, TDM program. Um, and so the way that um, this guide works um, is that a uh, the travel demand management program standards guide 
assigns a point value to uh, different travel demand management strategies. Um, and all of these, these I should mention, because we're uh, kind of climate change focused on this, all of these strategies, the points for these strategies are weighted uh, based off of the estimated um, reductions in vehicle miles traveled, um, and so therefore uh, uh, carbon output as well. Um, so after you, um, um, so once a development submits, then the development uh, will be assigned a point value, which is determined by the development's parking ratio and its geographic location. Um, in consultation with Move Minnesota, who is our um, TMO, a developer will then select enough TDM me measures from the guide to meet their point target. Um, and then one of the changes that we also made is that a developer or property man manager will have to assign a, a TDM coordinator who will work with Move Minnesota to implement the travel demand management plan over time. Um, so I'm going to briefly go through kind of how these two options work um, and, and talk a little bit about the differences in TDM uh, between these two options. Um, so in the reduced option, the way we were uh, proposing to reduce minimums was by introducing more administrative reductions and targeted exemptions to our zoning code. Um, so in this option, um, we, we were able to um, increase the amount of administrative reductions in our zoning code uh, from 3 to 28 by applying a 4% reduction to the minimum parking requirements per TDM point. Um, and and the, my idea um, kind of behind this strategy um, is that we could use the, the parking requirement and specifically the cost associated, associated with that parking requirement in order to create an incentive to invest in more TDM measures. Um, so in this option, um, a development would still um, likely have a minimum parking requirement, uh, but the development could reduce their minimum parking requirement by investing in TDM strategies. Um, the more uh, TDM investments, the less parking required, all the way down to zero. Um, so in this option, um, it's important to note that even with a minimum parking requirement in place, um, we created a mechanism that we could, you could, any development anywhere in the city could administratively uh, reduce their, their minimum parking requirements all the way down to zero. Um, th this option also relied on a number of targeted exemptions. Um, so in this option, we are proposing to exempt the first 3,000 square feet of most commercial development developments. Uh, we are proposing to exempt housing units that are priced at 60% of area median income or lower. Um, we are proposing to exempt um, structures that were built before 1955 from having to provide parking as a result of a change of use. Um, and then we are also proposing to exempt uh, properties that are within a quarter mile of light rail, streetcar, or bus rapid transit lines um, from minimum parking requirements. Um, so how would how does the elimination option work? Um, well, this was is easier to explain. In this option, uh, there is no uh, minimum parking requirements, period. Um, in this option, the TDM guide uh, still exists. Um, however, th there's no um, incentive to do additional TDM measures beyond what's required um, in this option. Um, and so both options, um, you know, had, had different uh, benefits. Um, but ultimately, uh, the, the eliminate option would, have res would result in the most affordability uh, for renters and homeowners, the most flexibility for uh, business owners and developers, and the uh, simplest to administer for city staff. However, one of the uh, trade-offs between uh, the two options uh, was that TDM incentive. So in the reduced minimums option, again, we are using the, the parking minimum and specifically the costs associated with uh, developing that parking in order to incentivize um, additional TDM measures and developments. Um, in the eliminate option, we didn't develop an incentive to for more TDM options. And so that was one of the the trade-offs between the two that the uh, Planning Commission and City Council had to consider. Um, so this study was released in March 19 of this year, um, and we uh, gave two citywide webinars that were um, open to the general public, as well as uh, presentations to a number of community groups and business associations um, around the city. Um, and the way that uh, 
that uh, we gave our presentations and, and you've seen pieces of it through throughout this um, presentation is that we created kind of a storybook um, format for our presentations in order to take kind of wonky uh, parking policy and, and make it um, and present it in a way that's digestible to the everyday person. Um, and we also, um, with this approach, you know, really wanted to make an effort to kind of speak to what, um, you know, parking reform means to different, um, you know, stakeholders throughout the city. Um, so we created these characters like renter Renee, homeowner Harriet, shopkeeper Shana, developer Danielle, and planner Paul um, to talk about, you know, how parking policy can benefit um, them. Um, and, and that extensive um, kind of outreach effort really paid dividends. Um, so at the on April 30th, the Planning Commission held a public hearing um, and roughly 70% of the public that submitted comments indicated that they preferred uh, the option to eliminate um, minimum parking requirements. Um, and so if, if you're someone that's um, you know going to engage in this work for your for your city, um, one kind of tidbit I want to leave you with is that you should go into it knowing that there is a broad coalition of, of kind of uh, unlikely bedfellows that that will support uh, parking reform, right? So, so if you can communicate this in a way to different stakeholders, you know, you could get housing advocates that are interested in, in you know, afford, uh, developing more affordable housing. You can get kind of big business people to support this that want to make development easier, et cetera. Um, so in September of this year, uh, the city council voted 6-1 to uh, approve the option to fully eliminate minimum parking requirements. And since October 1st, we've had no minimum parking requirements in St. Paul. Um, so that is what I got for today. Thank you, Thank Tony. You, Tony. That was really that was great. Really and I love the graphics in, in your slides and everything as well. Um, and it's really, you know, I, this, you know, what happened in St. Paul has definitely been in the news. And um, so it's great to get a little bit more insight into the background and the reasoning and um, and that final decision that was made. And um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, just a reminder to everyone to put any questions in the chat or feel free to raise your hand um, or just unmute yourself. Sean, it looks like you have a question. So one of my questions for both Barb and Tony is the issue of kind of the chicken and the egg with individual cities trying to eliminate parking and have density while the some of the bigger infrastructure things are counted are kind of under the control of their county, like where the BRT is going to go and all that. So number one, how how to ramp up better meetings where the cities are kind of agreeing to higher density, less parking, whereas the and the county is going to say, yeah, we're going to make sure that this BRT comes through. And then the other part of it is like with all the federal infrastructure dollars coming through, like how can people challenge the assumptions related to travel predictions and BMT predictions and parking requirements and parking demand? Given the new hybrid commuting model and co you know COVID and like all these downtown businesses like these office buildings being half empty because nobody would. so how do we how do we help people understand what's behind the curtain in terms of the like the the numbers that engineers are using for travel prediction or whatever. It seems like it's hard to un uncover that thing, you know. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you, Sean, for that question. And Tony might have some thoughts about this, but you know, part of the reason of that we're having this mm -hmm. workshop, that we developed the guidebook, that we're doing the case study document, that you know, Tony is going on the road <laughs> talking about the, what they've done is to really communicate that um, it's all of this is connected, and that changing parking will and and charging more for parking and not having abundant parking everywhere you know will result will result in reduced vmt um, and so 
uh, you know, our hope, I think, or my hope is that, you know, this might be some work that um, could be embedded within the work of the Met Council. It could be embedded within the work of MnDOT. Um, it could be better understood by um, regional and local and county decision makers, you know, such that our parking policy is is more is thought of more as part of our regional transportation policy, our statewide transportation policy. So, Tony, you have any any thoughts about that? Um, yeah, so you, you kind of mentioned um, uh, transit planning um, as a part of your question as well, um, and I got kind of two thoughts um, about that. So, so one thing um, that that we've successfully done in, in St. Paul is just advocate for your long range, you know, plans to be changed. Like if you don't think there's enough transit coming to your city, you know, work on the comp plan and and work with, um, you know, whoever is providing your your uh, transit lines to get those lines added. Um, the other thing about, you know, parking reform and, and transit planning is that if you eliminated or reduced um, your, your parking minimums, um, you'll be able to build a more dense environment uh, with a greater mix of uses, which then makes um, your community more attractive for uh, new transit investments. Um, and so if you're, you know, trying to attract transit, I mean, you could, uh, like St. Paul, start with you know, eliminating minimums, um, where you're going to get that future transit um, in order to kind of develop that supporting density and mix of uses um, over time. Um, I wanted to circle back to Jake's question about electric vehicle charging infrastructure. And Barb, I saw that you you were going to reach out to um, Tony Jordan about that, but I wanted to give Tony Johnson. Um, is, is there <laughs> anything that St. Paul is doing to um, think about how that infrastructure is getting built in to parking structures or lots. Sure. So, so we we currently I, I I didn't do um an EV ready ordinance as part of this parking study, uh, but it is something that that's coming and is on the docket. Um, so so we'll uh, you know probably have something within the next couple years. Uh, but but outside of kind of zoning and land use controls, one of the things that the city of St. Paul has done is partnered with our car um, to develop um, kind of our shared EV network uh, between the core um, cities. Um, so in the next couple of years, you're going to see a lot more shared EVs um, throughout St. Paul and, and Minneapolis. So it's exciting times. To do that. Definitely. Um, and then one more here before we kind of jump into breakout rooms um, from Laura. Are there, and this is for you, Tony, I think, are, are there any minimum requirements for handicap parking? Yeah. Yep. Um, yes, there is. So the way that handicap um, parking works is it's it's not, there's not like a minimum number uh, that you would have to build. It, you have to build um, handicap spaces uh, based off of the number of, of regular parking spaces that you build. So uh, um, for a residential development, anything that's over five units is gonna have to provide um, a handicap parking space. Um, and then for commercial developments, um, if they build any parking at all, the first parking space is going to have to be a handicap parking space. Um, and those are something that, you know, it's part of the state building code as well as there's federal regulations around that. Um, and so that's not something that you, you can't just get rid of handicap parking with parking reform. Um. Good. Good to hear. Um, Laura, I see you have a couple other questions, but I thought um, those might be good for the breakout rooms. So I'm going to go ahead and um, Put you all in there. We have everyone. We're just getting everyone back in. Here are the questions you were supposed to have on the screen before you magically went into a breakout room. Sorry about that. <laughs> I hope you had things to talk about. Barb, do you want to? So, um, yeah, I will. Do we um do we have everybody back that was in a small group? I will double check, but okay. um, our rooms are closed. Yes. OK, great. Um, so we we had a really interesting discussion in our small group and um, both the city of Richfield and the city of North St. Paul um, are doing things that I think would be worth uh, sharing with the full group. So the idea here is just, 
you know, to hear what you're doing and to figure out um, what you think the barriers are. And then are there ways in which, um, you know, a small working group on parking or some other technical assistance um, would be valuable to you? So I wonder if either Nellie or Andrew from our group would be willing to just share a little bit about what is happening um, in their cities. Hi, yeah, sure. this, this is, is Andrew Wise. Oh. oh, sorry. Go ahead. You go first. <laughs> you go. Okay. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'll be. I'll be quick. We can both go. Um, so my name is Andrew Wise. I'm a, a planning commissioner uh, with the city of North St. Paul. And um, uh, as I mentioned in the, the small group, the timing of this really couldn't have been better because we're about. We're just about to start. Um, reviewing our parking requirements in North St. Paul. And I think these are requirements that haven't been um, really looked at closely in, you know, probably a decade or more. So um, it's great timing. I think, um, you know, just in terms of our unique situation, we were looking at a lot of um, uh, uh, pedestrian and bicycle um, integration. We have the Gateway Trail, which is um, one, basically one block off of our, our main downtown street. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's something that really hasn't been tapped yet, at least in North St. Paul of, you know, realizing that we have this highway of bikes that's just so close to our main commercial, um, downtown area and, um, trying to get those, you know, the connections from the gateway trail into our downtown um, you know, really looking at signage and um, just bicycle parking, of course, and um, infrastructure for bicycles throughout downtown. Um, and uh, we are, uh, we host a, a classic car show every Friday in the summer. So we have a huge influx of cars every Friday night. So we definitely have a a sense by, I think, the business community of of a level of usage that I think probably only occurs you know in very select times um select times of the year and even select days uh within that time so i think there is a big disconnect between the business community and planning commission and and planning staff in our town to some extent but i think it's probably one that um you know with as has as has been mentioned you know i think some of the data that's been presented today is a huge first step in kind of aligning our our visions and um yeah, I think that's it. Nelly, you want to take over? Yeah. Um, yeah, so in Richfield, we uh, were almost um, fully passed uh, a new bike parking ordinance. So it goes to council for a final reading on Tuesday. Um, and that um, that was a really cool thing. We uncoupled it from uh, auto parking. So in the past, it was like, you know, a, a certain percentage of your acquired auto parking you have to match with bike parking, um, which isn't dynamic and it doesn't um, it doesn't get away from auto parking. So we've uncoupled that and now it's based on land use and um, a residential capacity and um, yeah, gathering spaces. And um, so that's a really cool thing. And then we are working on drafting our electric vehicle parking ordinance. Um, so that still hasn't gone to planning commission or anything yet, but um, we've worked with some neighboring cities and it's, yeah, it's coming along and we're super excited about that. Um, and I think, you know, our, our normal auto parking ordinance hasn't been looked at super recently, so we'll probably dive into that in the future as well. Um, and just, uh, you know, try to look at our goals and reduce parking wherever we can, which is hard in a mostly residential suburban city, um, but we have a lot of, you know, mixed use developments and higher density development. The future is bright. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you both for sharing what's happening in, in your own cities. I love, you know, hearing about what's happening. Barb, did you have anything else to add from your group? Uh, I don't I don't think so. Well, I guess one thing is we did hear back or I did hear back from um, Tony Jordan from the National Parking Reform Network. And uh, uh, I didn't get much detail, but he said that the state of Oregon had actually passed an EV ready law. 
So that's something that we'll look into and we'll um, get the details back to you. And I don't know if that applies to all developments, if that applies to housing or what that applies to. So um, something's happening in Oregon. That's all we know. Great. Um, and then I think we had two other groups. So if anyone has anything to share from their groups or if you want to poke somebody to, to share what you heard them say, um, feel free to unmute yourself too. So maybe I could then, if if no one has a comment, I mean, if you're from another city, we'd love to hear, you know, what the status of your parking requirements are, whether you have looked at them recently or not. Um, and then we also, I think, are interested in knowing, would um, some kind of a working group on, on parking innovation, parking change be of interest to you? And you could you could just say yes or no, or you could write something in the chat, but you know, that's a question that we're interested in uh, having having you uh, talk to us about. So. Yeah, thanks, Barb. I'll put our Green Step email address in the chat as well. So um, if that's something that piques your interest or you want to talk to another, you know, colleague or commissioner um, about first, you can contact us through there and I can connect you with Barb. And then, yeah, I would say that also in conjunction with that parking team with Barb, uh, getting together with other cities in your county um, to team up on VMT reduction parking uh, and all this new federal infrastructure dollars for roads and EVs. I think it would be a good opportunity to team up so that you're, you're not being suddenly like, hey, there's this money, but we don't are our area is not getting our fair share, like how to team up a bit more to reduce VMT and greenhouse gas emissions while making the most of getting money for your cities and county. I had a question that I don't think really came up. We've talked about electric vehicles, but we haven't talked about autonomous vehicles. And from all of the things that I'm hearing on what's predicted to change with that is that we're going to need less roads and certainly less parking as as we see more autonomous vehicles. If you can imagine, you know, Lyft and Uber plus, um, you know, driving around and taking us to where we need to go. The cars just continuously drive. They never stop and park somewhere. They drop you off. They pick you up. Is that something that, um, you know, Barb or Tony or anyone else, are those are those things that were, you know, put into consideration? Are we hearing that cities thinking about that future too? The Minnesota Design Center does have great resources um, on dealing with autonomous. You know, electric vehicles and all that changes whether you need parking lots and all that. So I could share some of the resources from the Minnesota Design Center um, with the guy who used to run the architecture department. Uh, Be good. Great. Yeah, and I'm not well informed about autonomous vehicles, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> but the question is, we need somebody to also deal with this new landscape related to hybrid commuting and how to deal with understanding the different types of commuting patterns and reducing the need for office space. Can you add more housing where you used to have just office buildings? And like, who is there? Can we get just tell somebody they have to do that for us <laughs> at MnDOT or in Met Council or somebody? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, remember, uh, uh, Professor Fisher had done, you know, a study looking at making parking ramps um, or designing parking ramps such that they could be converted to other uses um, over time. But I think they also found that, you know, they cost more. And so there was reluctance on the part of, of uh, 
some parking ramp developers to build those kind of ramps. Um, but we've certainly had great examples in downtown St. Paul where buildings became parking and now they're back to being housing. So hopefully more of that um, will be able to occur. And, and if we don't need all this commercial space that we'll be able to turn some of it into other other uses. Um, I have a question for Tony. Um, Tony, your slides are just incredibly good and a lot of them have images that I think could be used by um, other cities to make their case for change um, to parking. Some of them, you know, apply to any city and some of them have, um, you know, data that you could plop your own city information into them. Are those, are your slides actually you know, available in the public realm that other cities could just borrow from the slide deck that you have? Yeah, uh, that'd be fine with me if you want to use them. Um, some of the, the slides were um, developed by our consultant team, Nelson mm -hmm. Nygaard. Um, yeah. I, I can reach out to okay. okay with it, but I think I think they'll be fine. Okay. Any other really graphic kind of looking at the slides. Yeah, they really, they're so good. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, yeah I'll give them a plug if yeah if you guys are working on parking reform in your cities um, they're they were a great consultant to work with um, so I worked with them on uh, the TDM um, piece of it um, and so what they did was help me calibrate the point system uh, based off of the estimated uh, reduction in vehicle miles traveled for each strategy uh, and then they also helped uh, me put together the storybook presentation so I could yeah, take my really wonky study and simplify it and talk about it in a, in a way that everyday people understand. So anyway. Great. And thanks, Tony. I saw that you also said you have a list of EV ordinances from around the country and we'll we'll put those a link to those resources in the follow up email that goes out to the participants in the workshop. Definitely. And trying to share some more best practices that relate to um, electric vehicle charging in the Green Step program here in the chat too. Okay. Um, all right, see if we have any more questions. Tammy asks, has anyone used some of the new innovative materials like green concrete um, to reduce carbon output? Ooh, good question. Yeah. Not that I can think of. Um, I know, you know, some cities experimenting with pervious, um, mm -hmm. you know, pavement or or pavers. Haven't heard of any examples in Minnesota, so maybe something to keep an eye out for. And then Jake asks, can we use some of your stuff, Tony? Um, for technical assistance to municipalities across the metro, he's going to email you. We go, well, we go way back. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Sean, I see your question. Will the parking ordinance updates include issues related to reducing light pollution and water runoff? Is that is that correct? Yeah, is that for is that for St. Paul, Sean? Um, yeah, in St. Paul, that would be good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we um, didn't um, they our ordinance um, in those two regards. You know, one of the things like I don't think we're completely done with the program. I can see us following up with a lot of um, other stuff, and so that's something that could be included in the scope for the next follow up study. Um, so one of the things probably next steps in St. Paul, we talked about, you know, EV ready ordinance. Um, there was a desire to lower maximums uh, by the Planning Commission, which we didn't do with this study. And so there's a number of uh, follow ups. And so when we're scoping out the, the study and if you're interested, uh, please provide comments when we're scoping the study. Um, so we could get stuff like that as, as part of the initial scope and look at developing ordinances. Great, thank you. Um, okay, 
Barb, maybe we should uh, move to the next slide and wrap things up here. And I muted you because uh, you were taking notes and it was cutting out Tony. <laughs> well, I just want to thank um, everyone for your participation, especially to thank um, Tony Johnson for his fabulous presentation about parking reform in St. Paul. Um, the next steps with this work is just to promote the guidebook more widely, complete this case study report. So if you have uh, innovation in your city or you have another city that you know uh, and Minnesota has made some changes that you're interested in learning about, you know, let me know. Um, and then we're going to review the Green Step guidance as it relates to parking and make sure everything there is as um, is up to date um, with change uh, as it as it can be. And then I really hope that we can get um, an agency, uh, be it, it Met Council, one of the regional development commissions, um, or MnDOT to take on parking work in a bigger way because I think we saw and we've talked about how parking is is such a, a key, parking reform is such a key topic in terms of um, equity, sustainability, achieving our climate goals. And so it needs to have a bigger profile um, in the transportation world than it does today. So thank you all so much for participating today and thank you to Kristen and Emily and the PCA for making the event possible this morning. Thank you, Barb. Thank you, Tony. Thanks to everyone who who joined. Um, this was a really great topic that I, you know, personally have not put much thought into before Barb started working on the guide this year and um, working on this workshop. And I think it's, you know, certainly something for us to consider in, in any size community um, across the state. So. Thank you for this information. And again, we will send out the video recording um, slides, links to uh, resources that were shared, contact information, all of that with you later this week. Um, and Emily, you can just hop on the next slide. Um, and then here's just a quick uh, up, uh, review of what's up next for our monthly Green Step workshop series. So our next in December, we'll be talking about how um, communities can support green businesses. Um, and then more in after the holidays. So I put the link in the chat for you to see those and, and sign up there. And otherwise, we will see you next month. And um, thank you everyone for joining today.